Hi, my name is Dave Price from the True Life, uh, True Life Business Stories, and today our guest is Caroline Petton. Caroline, how are you doing? I'm very well. Thanks for having this conversation with me today, Dave. No, really good to meet you, and yeah, fascinating because it's a, a subject I know very little about actually. So, really good. Looking forward to finding out more about what you actually do. Um, but the first question I always like to start with is, how do you actually help people? Well, I work with individuals predominantly, helping them find lasting relief from symptoms, health concerns um, that they may have been experiencing often for a really long time. So whilst people may go to the doctor and understandably they would do that and find out what's going on in their bodies, maybe they might be diagnosed with something. But very often people are still living with a variety of symptoms I specialize in gut health but I don't just do that and the way I work is you don't just get eight minutes of my time like you might do if you went in to see a GP I spend 90 minutes at an initial consultation with somebody I find out as much as I can about them even in advance of seeing them by filling in a really detailed case history questionnaire and from that information I'm looking for the root causes of what are causing symptoms in the body and finding the gap, the connections between different body systems. It's quite complex, but I've been doing this for quite a long time now. So it's a completely different approach. I don't put a sticking plaster over symptoms. I'm looking to get to the root cause of the problem and come back from that approach really. Right, and it's a, a sort of a, an easy example you can give us of somebody who come to you with a specific symptom that you can talk me well, through? Well, uh, just to briefly say, obviously, people have a lot of gut problems. I don't need to go into any specific details of the types of things they might come and see me about. But, you know, it, they may go to the doctor and it may be diagnosed as, oh, well, you've just got, just got IBS. So many things are sort of classified into this category of IBS. Well, we need to go back beyond that and look beyond these symptoms. Has anyone really spoken to them about digestion? Has anyone really had that conversation about how food is digested in the body? There are three phases of digestion. If you can't digest your food properly, that in itself can have a knock on effect with everything else that's going on in the gut. So just as a very simplistic thing, I'm all about understanding what is going on in the body where from a digestion point of view and there are plenty of ways I've got plenty of tools to help people to support digestion and that alone can go a really long way to helping to overcome some of these symptoms. But because as you say I can see some people initial approach will be to a, a doctor or their, their GP uh, with some of these symptoms. Yeah of course. People normally talk to a GP first and they normally Always. come to you always I have to say that tend to find that most people will come to me when they've exhausted more than medical options and you do want to go down that route you do want to rule out there's nothing more sinister going on I absolutely get that but when they then find that there isn't much support and help for them um, and often people are then managing a condition not necessarily finding ways to get some relief from it and I'm certainly not talking about cure. We're not talking about that. We're finding people to go quite a significant way to get quite significant relief from symptoms. No one's really approached it from that way. And they often come to me because they're leading pretty miserable lives. Mm. You know, whether it's gut related or whether it's energy or hormonal for ladies or, you know, arthritic conditions, wear and tear and pain. There's so many different things I see people about. Or they have a cluster of a variety of symptoms. So do you see a rheumatologist or an endocrinologist or a dermatologist? It all gets compartmentalised and no one pulls it all together. So people often come to me really at the point where they're like, I don't know where else to turn, but I can't carry on living my life like this because it's I don't I feel pretty rubbish, actually. What can you do to help me? And that is often the point when people do. I'd love to see people earlier, but I do recognise the point at which people will often come to me to help them. Right, I see. It's still important to go down the, the GP route to begin with, do you feel, or...? Well, I, I would never stop somebody doing that. I'm a naturopath as well as a nutritional therapist, and people often go, what is that? And it is about taking a whole holistic approach to health. Um, there are times when you might need to go and see a doctor. And I and I think 
in the Western world, that is always going to be our first port of call, tends to be, because as I said, people often want to make sure there's nothing more sinister going on in the body. And I've got full respect for people wanting to do that. But there is so much that I can do before people get to the stage where they've let it go on for so long that things have got worse and worse and worse. And hopefully if people were prepared to come and embrace working with somebody like me earlier on in the cycle, there is so much that I can do to really help improve the quality of their life. Definitely. Right. And is there any reason in your, your view what stops people uh, talking to you initially or... Uh, are there any barriers you feel there? Well, I'll be honest with you. It's a cost point of view because, again, as particularly here in the UK, we've grown up with an NHS that is supposedly going to take care of everything and it doesn't cost you anything. So to then think, well, I'm going to then pay somebody to help me. I think that's why people don't do it. But I think that's definitely, definitely changing. I think there's a recognition that people need to take more responsibility for their own health, take matters into their own hands and not wait for until you get through the system. And of course, things are taking so long anyway through the NHS system that, you know, by the time you might have been seen or got anywhere to be told it's not much they can do potentially, um, then I think there is a growing recognition to work with somebody like me. And I often get, then get told, I wish I'd work with somebody like you much sooner, really. That's probably one of the things. Is there actually the awareness out there of people, of, of people like you out there, if you see what I mean? I think there's a there's a growing awareness, but I still think there isn't necessarily enough awareness. I think there is a a thought that if you've got nutrition in your title, that all you're doing is weight loss. And mm. my training is so much more in depth than that. That to me, if somebody comes to me for weight loss. I wouldn't necessarily say I am the best. I can help somebody with weight loss, but I tend to work with more complex things than that. Weight loss is just part and parcel of what I would do. Somebody, many people come to me and then, yeah, I'd like to lose a bit of weight as well. And then they will find they do lose that weight. But I don't, uh, I think there's too much of an assumption that people like myself are really just doing weight loss. And it is so much more complex. People with the right training, the right qualifications and experience of working with and a much more sort of complex uh, health conditions than that. I, I'm intrigued then on that point. How did you get into this? What was your, your background? So my background is very different, as it often is, with uh, people who chain, you know, get, end up in these types of therapy, working these sorts of therapies. Um, I worked for 20 years in corporate. Most of that was with BT. I was a procurement manager in BT, managing multi-million pound contracts and departments. And like many people, you reach a stage in your life when you think, is this all there is? I'm fed up with corporate life. I'm fed up of putting the hours in for not getting any reward from it. Um, not, I just was not finding it rewarding at all. Loved it when I started out. But as you get to a certain stage in life, you think there's got to be more to life than just doing this. And I can only describe it as a light bulb moment for me when it was, well, what my husband said to me, what else do you want to do? I said, I'm really interested in nutrition. It was only like a light bulb. It sounds a bit corny, but it really was. Um, I was always the sort of person who'd pick up a magazine, you know, not so much online in those days, but pick up a magazine. I'd always want to read about nutrition related stuff in the magazine and how it might have helped in different things. So, um, yeah, it, it, that was what the it was like a light bulb. And then it was a case of finding somewhere where I could study part time. I was working. Part, I had tw five year old twin girls. I had gone part time with BT, but it was never a part time job. Those sort of roles, you know, you still the job doesn't leave you when you walk out the door. Five year old twin girls working supposedly part time at BT, but it wasn't really. And then embracing and kicking off my nutrition training. And in the end, it took me five years to qualify. Five years. Yeah to complete the whole course. I mean, if you had more time, you could do it in three. You can't do it in less than three years. It's the equivalent of a degree. 
it's the same sort of level really as degree but at the time there are now some degree courses for nutritional therapy but when I was doing it, it was only sort of diploma it wasn't linked to universities but it was extremely in-depth training and people would not appreciate just how in-depth it is understanding the body systems understanding medical conditions understanding um uh, medications because I have to be very careful there's no interactions between her you know supplements and medications really in depth a full year of clinical practice training where you're working with volunteers and cases really really in depth well more in depth than I was expecting you to say really in depth yeah in is, can anybody call themselves a nutritionist well it's not a protected term and there's been a lot of talk out there amongst different depart, um, different organisations around what you can call yourselves. It's not protected. So it's very hard for individuals looking for somebody doing the sort of work that I do to know that they have found somebody who's really well qualified. I think one of the most important things is around the clinical practice training. You know, I spent, as I said, a full year doing clinical practice training because you can do all the theory in the world. But unless you know how to try and put it into practice with an individual where they come to you with their presenting symptoms and their case, what do you do with that information? That's the tricky bit. And it's taking all your theory and then putting it into practice and taking all that theory and the complexity of what you've learned and putting it across to people in really simple terms that they understand and then they can go away and put it into practice what you're asking them to do. Um, so no, it is it is a tricky one. Um, I've been involved with the um, setting up of a professional association called the Naturopathic Nutrition Association. I helped to found it. I was chair for seven years and then I was the accreditation officer. So we were then accrediting nutritional therapy colleges for Michael's was naturopathic nutrition, but let's not worry about what that means, but it was naturopathic nutritional therapy. So I was also accrediting colleges as well. So there were some big deviations in standards out there actually. Right, so literally I could read a couple of books and just call myself a nutritionalist. There are some online courses that could be sold to you. Come and do this online course, 99 pounds and become a nutritionist. There are things out there, yeah. But I would hope people, you know, I've got insurance to practice and I can only get my insurance to practice because I've completed certain courses. Do all nutritionists out there have insurance? You know, I have insurance. That was one question I, I was going to ask. If I've got an issue and I'm thinking, yeah, I want to go down that nutritionist route, what are the questions I should be asking somebody to know if they have got that sort of professional background that you have? compared to somebody who's just... What pro what professional association do they belong to would be a starting point. Well, who did they study with? Um, but it, that alone is very difficult because unless you really know um, the industry, you know, you it's very difficult to know. It's a bit like if you go and see a, I don't know what you could compare it to. I don't know, massage, let's just say massage therapist. I bet there are lots of li different levels of people who've trained in massage, potentially. I don't, I don't know. You don't really know. It's about forming that relationship with people. Um, yeah, doing a little bit of research around the individual, about them and where they, where they studied, what professional associations are they with? Do they have professional insurance? Having insurance is really, really important. I can't be a member of my professional association without insurance. I presume that works both ways as well, that you yeah. can't be one without the other. So yeah. Yeah. professional association membership and yeah. insurance. And probably... yeah. a, a couple mm -hmm. of important things, yeah. 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 Cool. Um, and are the barriers, as you say, apart from the financial side, of people coming to talk to someone mm. like yourselves do you find any other barriers at all there I think a barrier um, is people have got to be in the right frame of mind and they've got to be prepared to make some changes in their lifestyle and in what they're eating so they've got to be committed now 
I think some people have put off coming to see somebody like me because they think, oh God, she's going to tell me I can't have a cup of coffee. I can't ever have a glass of wine. Oh, I'm going to have to follow this really pure diet. Pizzas are out the window. No, it's not like that at all. I'm very human. I have coffee. I had a glass of wine last night. In fact, I was even meeting a friend at Pizza Express last night. It's about tweaking your diet and working with somebody like me. You work with the individual to personalize it, understanding their lifestyle, understanding their likes and dislikes and helping them tweak their diet. So you take them on a journey from where they are, they are today. So it's very manageable for them um, and they feel they can manage it. They can incorporate it into their lifestyle. So it's a very subtle way of making changes that help them get improvements and I want some quick wins for my clients so they can see it's work things are working but without them feeling they can never have a cup of coffee they can never have a glass of wine they can't go out and socialize in public because we're humans at the end of the day we've got to be able to do that so I think that is a potential barrier to picking up the phone and getting in contact with somebody like me because they think oh my god when I tell her what I'm eating I see that socially people go oh my god you know, I'm sorry, they're almost apologizing for what they're eating in front of me. I'm going, it's fine. Honestly, you know, it's absolutely fine. But I do believe it's all about everything in moderation. And, and we don't tend to do things and eat things in moderation. That's the problem. Yeah, I, I must admit, I can totally identify where you're coming from there. Um, yeah, too much wine, and etc. So I'm intrigued how much other factors does psychology actually play in what you're doing because I was assuming it'd be right you need to do that do that do that and that's it yeah I mean when I did my training in my final year you know I, I'm not trained in NLP but we touched on that you've got to meet the person where they're at um you've got to try you know you change your tone of voice when you're talking to different types of people and it's for, for me well psychology um, is important like I said they've got to be in the right mind space to be ready and prepared to be like yes I've got to make some changes I cannot carry on like this I need to work with somebody like Caroline um, to really help me improve my health um, but there are some people I might refer on to somebody where I think they might benefit from hypnotherapy for example so I'm very much aware when additional support may be very very useful um, but I think really with mindset, it is about, for me, it's making things easy for them, actually. That's what I have to do. And it's also clear explanations, making it simple for them, because I don't want people leaving my consulting room and thinking, oh, my God, I feel so overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. They need to be leaving the consulting room motivated and buoyed up and ready to get started and that's what I aim to achieve and I sometimes get people messaging me afterwards oh thank you really enjoyed the session yesterday I've been straight out to the supermarket and I bought some nuts for you know just something simple like that you've got to try and meet them where they're at give them some simple things to take away explain why you're asking them to make the changes so they understand it so there's more chance of success and hopefully leave them feeling motivated and want to carry on and get going with it. Right. And so that's the initial session. And do you normally always have follow on sessions or is I very rarely work with somebody on just one consultation. I do occasionally if somebody, for example, was like, Caroline, there isn't anything majorly wrong with me, but I'd really like to know I'm getting older. Um, and I want to make sure the way I'm eating is supporting my health for the longer term. I'll do a one-off consultation, no problem at all. But I don't, and I explain to people, I don't really do one-off consultations when people approach me with, I've got this health concern, I've got these symptoms, I've been struggling for five years, 10 years, whatever it might be. I explain to them that I take them on a journey. We can't do everything at one consultation because it'd be too overwhelming. And um, you know what works for one person isn't necessarily gonna work for somebody else. So whilst I've got a lot of experience, and I know things that can really make a difference. We can't assume that every single person is going to react in exactly the same way and that we'll see the same benefits straight away. So it's really important I work with individuals over um, three months. 
I do three month programs, five month programs typically. And I also do additional consultations if people near it need it because I want to get them from where they are now. I want to see success. I want them to see the changes and the improvements and they need to buy into that at the start because they need to accept. And I always do a discovery call with people and they need to accept that you can't expect the change to come in one consultation. And generally they go, yeah, I realize that, I realize that. So I do get them to commit to a program of length. Mm. I, I can see that, yeah, the bit of an overwhelm. Of, if I was to talk to you, I'd think, oh my God, my diet, my exercise, ah. Oh. <laughs> um, and I could probably tell you lots of things that I think I should be, be changing. Um, but actually identifying, let's do this in small easy steps yes and that's the more the... achievable it's more achievable i do give people a few different things to do i don't just say right i now want you to just go away and drink water i don't work quite like that because I, I there'll be a few things but not too much in one go um and like the dietary things you know if someone comes to me they're drinking 10 cups of coffee I'll go, I explain why that's not helping them. And I always link it back to their symptoms. And then I go, so, and they go, yeah, okay. I go, right, so what can we achieve then? How much could we cut down by in the next month? Could mm -hmm. we make it six cups a day? Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, what can I have instead? Well, do you like rhubosh tea? Do you like any herbal teas? Do you like this and that? You know, and it's a yes or a no or whatever it might be. Okay, do you think you could get to six? Sometimes people have come back and gone, I've gone down to two cups a day. Or if it's things like loads of fizzy drinks, which I really don't like, and I say to them, fizzy drinks are not helping you at all. Can't you keep it for an occasional treat? Sometimes people have come back and said, cut it out completely after listening to what I've said but it's it's that journey so like you know 10 cups of coffee I'm not going to go cut it out well I don't cut it out but I don't go cut it out and I'm not going to say if you're on 10 cups today right you need to be on two tomorrow it's unrealistic yeah. not many people could cope with that and they'd get you know they'd get the reaction from it it's not achievable so they'd try and go down to two and then think oh I feel rubbish now we were back up on 10 again so you've got to take them on that journey mm. Yeah, it's it's a journey, as you yeah. as you say, isn't it? Mm. And so the, you said three and five month coaching programs normally. Typically, that's what I do, and at the moment they're the two main ones I I I offer because I've got a lot of experience and I know what can be achieved since and what could take longer than that. Um, and so I always do a, a what I call a discovery call with individuals. Um, have a conversation with them what are they trying to achieve what why did they contact me in the first place a, a sort of brief synopsis of their history just a, a shortish called 20 minutes from that I can determine whether I feel within my shorter program we can really achieve a lot or whether I think my longer pre a program would be more beneficial for them um, and that is based on that really right and it never crossed my mind, but presumably there are a lot of this, yeah, the consultations are done online rather than face to face. Yeah, I mean, through COVID, I was really busy and I was like zoomed out by the end of the day. Of <laughs> Everything was, I was lucky, the sort of work I do, I can do online. It's great. I can do that online. It's really beneficial for me. I do love to meet clients face to face for an initial consultation if I can, if they live reasonably local to me. Because as a naturopath, I do a few other diagnostic little things. Um, I'm trained in iridology, which is I have a special camera to look at the people's eyes and the markings in their eyes. And that can give me some information about inherent strengths and weaknesses. And I look at nails and tongue and I look at how people sit and their posture and how they're breathing. So that sort of thing, you can't get much over a Zoom call at an initial consultation. That face to face bit really helps to be, build rapport, makes people feel more comfortable because at the end of the day, they're sharing a lot of private, sensitive information. And of course, it's completely confidential very sensitive private information so the sitting with me um just helps people to relax a bit more and you get a bit more of that rapport however i do work over zoom um for initial consultations if people aren't close to me and as i said that all through that covid time it was all done over zoom and follow-up appointments i give people the option i say for your own convenience it's completely up to you if you want to do it over zoom some are busy working, they do it over Zoom, and others just love to come here 
have that chat with me. I think they, I think it's their time. I think it's because they've invested in their own health. I think it's like it's their time. So this sort of bit of driving to me, sitting with me and going away afterwards, I think it's like really important to them that it's that whole time and it's for them really important to them. But So I give them the option. Right. Oh, you got me intrigued. Ir iridation. Looking in someone's eyes. Ir I knew. <laughs> Iridology. Iridology is looking at the coloured parts of the eye, the iris. This goes back 400 plus years. Not very well known in the UK, but is recognised in other parts of the world by medical professionals in Greece and Germany, Russia, places like that. It is recognised. There's been a lot of um, research now of um, mapping. It all started by somebody mapping someone's health concerns and looking at the eyes. And as time has gone on, it's like reflexology. Have you heard of reflexology? You know, the feet. You know, if you go and see somebody with reflexology, they'll say that part of the foot links to your ovaries, for example, or not for you, or, you know, links to your thyroid or whatever it might be. In the eyes, you can see the different um, links to different parts of the eyes because it comes from the brain stem um, and the nerve endings and, and just different markings and the colours of the eyes and the different things I can see under the magnification with my special camera can help me pinpoint. I can show them that they've got a really tiny digestive zone and it might make it harder for them to digest food. I can see irritation around the digestive zone that's come from the nervous system. And I can say, I think stress is really impacting your digestive capability. And that might be why you're good. So we need to look at stress relief type work. I can see where people struggle um, with the lymphatic system. And also, anyway, it's, it's you know, I don't do it as in depth as other, other people might do. I don't advertise myself as just a neurologist. I tend to just like to use it at the start of my consultations. So as I said, just give me some pointers and helps me identify, you know, where there are, well, more likely the inherent weaknesses than the inherent strengths is what I like to like to see really. And just sort of explain to my clients and they're fascinated by it really yeah that sounds fascinating yeah I hadn't even heard of that before at all so so i imagine most of your clients actually not self-diagnosed they come to you for, for themselves for their own uh own reasons and backgrounds um but i was also intrigued i noticed on your website you're actually doing uh corporate retreats yes yes i didn't put the two together initially so, um, you know, I do all this work one to one with clients, just to sort of a slight step back. I'm really passionate about sharing my knowledge, first of all, you know, so that's why I, I go live in my Facebook group. I've got a YouTube channel, podcasts, I've launched a podcast as well. But last year for the first time, and it was something I wanted to do before, but I ran some ladies retreat days at this stunning venue in the Cotswolds, beautiful venue. Um, and I made all the food and, you know, brought people together and explaining, you know, giving them some of my knowledge and information in a really nice environment in a very gentle way. And it came to me that I'm really passionate about um, trying to part, pass on my knowledge in the corporate space, in the workplace, the importance of nutrition and what we eat and how it impacts vitality and performance and productivity and health overall and well-being. So I decided, well, wouldn't it be wonderful for teams to take their, you know, take a team off site for a day? Give, you know, it's, it not only is it a way of a sort of um, not so much team building, but, you know, to to thank the team by taking them off site, getting them away from the office, but then sharing my knowledge with them that they can then take back into the workplace and into their own personal lives as well. So that's why I launched that. It's just a really nice thing to do. It makes total sense. I mean, if you're running a team of people, you want them to be as healthy uh, and well-being, physically, mentally, etc., as they possibly can be. So, yeah. yeah, really interesting. Yeah, the idea of the company actually understanding the benefits. Yes, you know, there's a growing awareness on the companies in companies now, isn't there? We know about well-being in the workplace, particularly around mental health, and that's great. But I think there's that there's a missing link with nutrition, actually. I think it's really overlooked. I know how powerful nutrition is to health and well-being and vitality and energy and so much more. 
And unless you've gone through, say, a programme with me to know the difference, I don't think people are really aware in the workplace of how it could make people so much more productive and, you know, sharpen decision making. I've had a client this year who said to me, uh, my energy is so low in the afternoon. He's got, you know, reason, very responsible job. My decision making, I have to do in the morning. I can't do my decision making in the afternoon because my energy levels are just so low. I can't think straight. And think how many people are feeling like that. He's not alone. No way is he alone in feeling like that. You know, that mid-afternoon dip and you're not thinking yeah. straight. Doesn't need to be that way. No, it's not the sort of thing people normally admit to. You wouldn't admit to it were. Of course so. you wouldn't admit to it. Oh, I'm so tired. I can't do anything. But people can't, you know, are not productive all day long. They may appear to be productive. It doesn't mean they are. Mm. And from their own point of view, their people are working really hard at work, you know, stressful jobs, working really hard, giving everything to their jobs. Go home at night, probably flopping on the sofa, you know, or weekends with family and children. Sometimes people are taking all weekend to recover fully, to get back into the workplace on Monday, to start off the whole thing all over again. You know, and are they really firing on all cylinders? And nutrition is that missing link to making that happen. Mm. And in the, the group settings then, is it more of an educational basis? Mm. Yes, it would be, yeah. I mean, certainly if workplaces um, really recognise the importance of this, then I would be able to do one-on-one -on -one consultations if they were concerned about a member of staff, um, maybe kept taking time off sick, you know, like immunity, for example. Some people, you know, get run down and they're off sick because they can't recover from colds and keep getting repeated colds, whatever it might be. You know, if they had an individual like that in the workplace and said, Caroline, could you help them? Of course I can. I could do then do a private one-on-one -on -one consultation or series of consultations to really help them. But generally to start with, I think in the workplace, it's just generally getting that education in a group setting. Mm. I can see from an HR perspective what you can actually do to keep employees effective right. as possible and happy as healthy as possible is a direct benefit to the company's bottom line. Well, yes, it, yes, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of stats out there of, um, you know, people well, we're keeping all the time now, don't they? You can't get people back into work. Mm. People aren't well enough to go back into work now, but their pe companies are losing people. And an, an area where people uh, companies are really losing people is women of that 45 plus age bracket because of the menopause. You know, there's been a lot of talk around this. You lose some companies are losing really um, highly skilled women in maybe senior positions who cannot hold on to their jobs because of the symptoms they they are experiencing going through the menopause um brain fog and just so much else and more and women lose their confidence and with the hormonal changes again there's been a lot of good stuff out there around menopause awareness brilliant but what isn't talked much about is the difference you can make to women's menopausal symptoms by looking at them holistically looking at their nutrition looking at their stress levels thinking about the liver gut you know, I understand all of this and how it all links together. But the difference you can make to somebody, because I work with menopausal women, I know this because I do this one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, but there's, so as I said, there's, a, there's an awareness around what is menopause, tick, great, but not enough around, so what can we do to provide that missing link again from a nutrition point of view to help women get through this in the best possible shape with the least symptoms they possibly can especially if this sort of thing is taking women out of experienced women out of the workforce there's a massive drop off again i can't say off the top of my head but i put it in a post on linkedin before about the percentage of women that are dropping out of the workplace in that sort of 45 55 bracket and often people of 45 55 are in more senior positions mm. by then. And, the most and they're dropping out because they can't cope that's a huge impact on the, the business. Somebody's been working with you for 20 years. All that expertise. All that expertise. Just disappears because of a lack of yeah. knowledge and understanding. One of my clients I'm working with now, a senior HR director, big firm, came to me because of menopausal symptoms like brain fog. She said, I'm going into a meeting and I just, my word, I can't think. And now she's great and going mm. into 
going in for an interview for promotion, do you know what I mean? But she said, I could never have done that because I just I couldn't think straight and I, I couldn't let on that was happening. Yeah, I can see it actually being a real investment for a, a business, so their, their bottom line, just looking at things financially, as well as the increased well-being for their, their staff. Absolutely, yes. If you could say anything, if we had all the big CEOs in the top FTSE 100 here, what would you like to say to them? Oh, gosh, I would like to say that, um, oh, um, by understanding a bit about nutrition and understanding how if people can fuel and feed themselves better, it can make a massive difference to productivity and performance in the workplace, which can have an impact on your bottom line. Perfect. <laughs> love it and how are you actually seeing this the industry changing as you say there's more awareness of the health and well-being but what sort of changes are you seeing at the moment oh what changes am i seeing I, oh, a difficult question to answer you mean from an awareness point of view or more generally than that um i just went is that increased awareness is that driving how why people come to you or um oh I don't I don't know I can't think about I don't know actually I can't I was we sort of touched on it already the, but the term yeah. nutritionist was it even really about mm. years ago no it wasn't so much about and actually interestingly because I also call myself a naturopath and a slightly different training um that's not so well known in the UK but increasingly I get people coming to see me because they're looking for a naturopath it's a more holistic natural approach to your health yeah that's because I personally have never actually heard no. the term path until, until yeah. today we started talking exactly and that naturopathy is not a therapy in its own right my main therapy is nutrition that's my main therapy and specializing in gut health as well but um naturopathy is understanding the whole person and it is absolutely they were the first ones to talk about getting to the root cause of symptoms you've got to understand the body and you've got to understand the root cause um because otherwise if you don't get to the root cause of symptoms the symptoms aren't going to go away naturopaths also understand that the body has this inherent healing capability if it's given the right tools of course a lot of the right tools is giving it the nourishing food yep getting rid of toxicity out of the body you know that's another part of it gut you know naturopaths were the first ones really to talk about the gut health understanding how important healthy gut is for health and disease um which is partly why i went down to specialize in gut health because of having all my training in naturopathy and really understanding the relevance. You know, you are what you can eat, digest, absorb, the microbiome and all of that. So, uh, yeah. I must be that, that term, you are what you eat. We hear it flung, flung about, but just talking to you now, it's just so obvious. If you put a load of crap in your body, how are you expecting it? Yeah. Do you know what percentage of ultra processed food the typical person eats every day? on a calorie type basis. The percentage Ooh. of ultra processed foods, oh, processed and ultra processed foods in the UK, I the would... average person eats. My girlfriend is really anti ultra processed foods. So she's trying to get me, <laughs> luckily she does with the cookies. So she's trying to get me off it. But what proportion ultra processed foods? Probably before the slight awareness that I've got, I probably said 70%. It's on average, it's 60% in the UK, six zero, 60% of people, the average intake of food each day is coming from processed and ultra processed food. I mean, bread is a processed food. It's gone through so many processes. It's got so much other stuff added to it. It's not natural. Um, and then you get the ultra processed foods like ice cream and crisps and biscuits and other mm. things that people are buying. But the typical person is eating 60 percent now if you go to countries like italy and portugal it's about 13 percent one three and the uk is at 60 percent how can we be a healthy nation when we eat food like that but marketers are very clever of course to market food to be appealing and attractive appear healthy but it's not food at the end of the day and it's not fueling you it's not feeding you it's not nourishing your body and your cells 
the difference in those uh, statistics compared to, to other other countries is that in your view is that down to the marketing of how food companies that operate in it's the country? Be, I think it comes back to a lot of things. You go to countries like probably Italy, other maybe Spain, Portugal, France, you know, people would sit around the table. It was a big thing, wasn't it? Sitting around the table, spending time at the table, eating. We lost that many years ago. Things became very convenient driven. So I think we got from a marketing food manufacturing, We, I think the UK, we follow America, don't we? And I think we followed that much sooner than some of these other nations did. So I think you just don't see the quantity of this sort of processed food in some of these countries that you do see here in the UK. Mm. It's, it's just everywhere, isn't it? It's everywhere. It is, yeah. Yeah, you walk into a corner shop and you look around and like, what's actually healthy in here? I go into a news agent, you don't need to know names to go and buy something, and they plant right next to the till, you know, really cheap chocolate to buy. You know, oh, do you want to have this today because it's only a pound? No, I don't actually, thank you. It's it's We're surrounded by it, surrounded by all this stuff that we just don't need. I suppose that, uh, there's a lot of money in ultra-processed food compared to natural food. It hasn't got the same purse strings behind it to push it. Oh, of course it hasn't, no. But there is definitely a growing awareness of uh, healthy foods. There's a growing small industry grow, uh, you know, around healthy foods. I'm a judge for the Nourish Awards in the UK, and the Nourish Awards are all around healthy foods, healthy products. Um, there's, and the categories of that, and it's growing year on year on year. Um, so this was the, the Nourish Awards. Nourish Awards. I'm yeah. Google that. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, there's loads of categories and so many different uh, small food manufacturers bringing out some wonderful products. I do appreciate often, though, you buy natural and you buy some of these things, it's more expensive. Um, but that's a growing, that's massively growing industry there. But what we need to get back to is just eating food. We need to get back to eating fruit, veg, meat, fish, eggs, you know, just normal food. That is food. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing what it is that you know, you recognize the ingredients and then you make things with it. That's what we ideally would get back to most of the time because I do appreciate we're busy people. So it's, you know, it's trying to do it most of the time and recognizing there are going to be days when it's not achievable and that's fine. And that's where I come back to everything in moderation. And, you know, if you if you manage it, and it's just not as of, you know, the 80-20 Pareto rule. If 80% of the time you could eat well and 20% of the time you slip, you'd probably be in a pretty good place mm. health-wise. People aren't even aware if they're hitting that 80% at all, though. They're just... No, not at all. Yeah. Mm. I, I'm intrigued. You talked about a lot about working with, with women. What, what percentage of the, the people you do one-to-ones with are men compared to women? quite a lot actually so whilst I feel my marketing in many ways is possibly more directed at women and last year I was running these ladies retreat days um I do actually have a lot of male clients and what I think is so refreshing now is how men are prepared to want to address their health concerns and want to address it in a natural way and I find that really refreshing I see younger lads up to people in their 70s or 80s you know or a lot in their a lot of my clients are in their 40s 50s age bracket I would say um but a lot of men what percentage have I got of men I haven't looked recently at least a third at least a third right. yeah and my retreat day this year I've decided my next retreat in May I've decided it's going to be a mixed retreat because I had a man who I'd met um, who came up to me and said, Caroline, are you ever going to do this so men can come to it? And I went, I have been thinking about it. He said, I'd really love to come. I said, well, with that, you've made me make up my mind. My next retreat day is going to be mixed, men and women. Really? No, that's great. Great to hear. Yeah. I, I suppose I just would have assumed men were less aware of this sort of thing. Definitely. Would be... Definitely. That's probably the biggest change, I would say, Dave. I'd say that, you know, you asked me a minute ago, what's hmm. the biggest change? I would say with men. I would say with men, big change, big change. So there's been obviously a lot of positive things that have come out with for men about taking better care of their health. So that's really positive. 
and mm-hmm. lovely that they'll come and see somebody like me and talk about all sorts of their health concerns and they're happy to sit and chat to me about it and it's positive really positive absolutely yeah no i can see how it works on on every every level really yeah um, yeah it <laughs> <laughs> it's just so obvious isn't it that you should be looking into your nutrition I... yeah look yeah. we all want to live longer but many people are living longer and stats about people are living longer but people aren't living longer and healthily most people are on many medications with aches and pains or they've got this condition or that condition surely we want to live longer and be feeling wonderful to really enjoy our life, particularly as we get older, particularly as we, you know, approach retirement. We want to be firing on all cylinders, having a great time. But not many people are just, you know, getting older, but they're just, you know, they're struggling oh, with health conditions and so much, yeah. And then suddenly the medication starts coming in. And... Yeah. Yeah. Do you... What about young people? Do they, do, do you have sort of age groups you say it's normally that sort of I would thing? say the bulk of my clients are probably in that sort of four, 40s and 50s, a lot of my clients, but I get older clients and I'd get younger clients. You know, I've, I've my current client, I've got a 23 year old girl at the moment. I've just finished working with her and also another 23 year old girl. I've worked with teenagers. Um, so, you know, it is across the board. Um, parents will contact me when they're particularly concerned about their children or even in their early 20s you know parents are you know concerned about mm. their still the children um and put them in touch with me um yeah and yeah all ages really all ages and it's never too late yeah I'm also wondering about the parents because if you're working with the parents do they then actually change what they're serving at home to their children well one would hope so because they'll say to me what they're cooking needs to be for the whole family mm. so I will sort of say okay for your evening meal what about doing x y and z and they'll say but at lunchtime when you're doing things for yourself that's when we can introduce the tin sardines for example do you know what I mean like oily fish that you know oh no one in the family will eat oily fish okay well, we could do it at lunchtime then. That's when you're cooking for yourself. But generally, I'm very aware we've got to change what the mother's eating or the father. Mm. Um, and it's got to be the whole meal that they're cooking for the family. Yeah, because if you can help them, you're actually... Absolutely. The whole, whole family's health, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about the knock-on effect of, yeah, once someone's got a better handle on their nutrition, that that moves through the family, mm. et cetera, yeah. It really does, yeah. Cool. Um, now it's been really interesting talking to you uh, about this, uh, and yeah, it, I suppose the benefits I just never really thought about before. Uh, something that hadn't come up on my my radar personally. Yeah. But yeah, it's so obvious when you when you talk to you the benefits of. Looking well, hopefully at... I've explained that really well to you, Dave. I hope so. You have indeed, yes. And I'm going to go and have a look at the Nourish Awards as well now. Yeah, it's interesting. Definitely. Cool. Well, no, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for your time, Carol. Um, it's been great to talk to you. And yeah, hopefully we shall see you on here again soon. Right. Thanks so much.